What's up guys, this is step one domination. We're gonna be talking about the second gas effect and diffusion hypoxia. And these are two subtype, uh, subtopics that are within the um, inhaled anesthetics uh, topic in pharmacology. So let's jump right into this. Here's a diagram I drew out to just kind of explain how inhaled anesthetics work. So an inhaled anesthetic is sent into the lungs to be breathed in, like say through a ventilator. And it's taken into the lungs and it travels down all in the different parts of the lung. And it reaches the alveoli of the lung. And in the alveoli of the lung, it then can travel into, this is a blood vessel, the blood. So first, it enters the lungs, obviously. Then it enters the bloodstream. And then from the bloodstream, it's able to, able to go into tissues. And the tissue that we want it to go into is the brain, because that's the, that's the tissue where you're going to begin, we want it to act on to have its effect. So that's kind of the basic way that uh, inhaled anesthetics work. You take the inhaled anesthetic in, it goes from the lungs to the blood, and then only from the blood can it reach the tissues, uh, the main one being the brain. Now notice that this is a double-sided arrow. So you can have a drug enter from the lungs, go to the blood and then go back again. And you can have a drug, um, the inhaled anesthetic, go from the blood to the brain or any other tissue and go back to the blood again and then go back to the lungs if it wanted to. It all depends on the solubility and the permeability of the membrane and whatnot. So this brings us to two important uh, definitions to know. Potency is the first one. Remember, potency is basically a measure of it's how it's basically the lowest dose of a drug needed to begin to show its effects for that drug, the minimum effects of that drug. For example, you have drug X, let's say you have a drug X and drug Y. And drug X at 20 milligrams, that's the first point at 20, so you say you're slowly raising the dose of the drug. And finally, at 20 milligrams that you give the patient, they begin to show the effects that whatever the effects that drug X is, whether it be vasoconstriction or an increase in blood pressure or whatever the drug does, 20 milligrams would then be basically the point at which the potency of the drug is marked at, like to, let's say on a graph. Whereas drug Y, drug Y, so let's say it's a similar class of drug, it only starts showing its effects at 40 milligrams. So basically, potency, that's how potency works. So a drug that has an increased potency, it just means that the drug will show its effects at a lower, at a lower dose. So X here is the one that has the increased potency compared to Y. Now, what affects potency? The main thing that affects potency as far as an R concept that we need to know is going to be lipid solubility. Solubility. An increased potency occurs when you have an increase in lipid solubility. Well, of course, that makes sense. The cell membrane is, is a phospholipid bilayer. And this is a lipid-soluble membrane. So drugs that are more lipid-soluble can more easily cross over these uh, these bilayers. See, like in the lung, the alveoli, they have a lipid bilayer in, in one of its many layers that it has to go through, but there's a lipid bilayer in there somewhere. Then even like going into a blood vessel, you're going to have to pat the cells, the endothelium, you know, the endothelial cells of a blood vessel that has a lipid bilayer for those cells. Again, going into the tissues, we know that tissues are just a group of cells and obviously those have lipid bilayers. So that's all dealing with potency. So Let's not confuse potency with the next thing that we're going to talk about. This is blood solubility. Now, we said that an increase in potency will just mean that you need less of the drug, or I'm sorry, it will show its effects at a lower dose. Whereas a decrease in blood solubility means that the drug will act faster. For, it doesn't matter what the dose is. So now we're not talking about the dose. It doesn't matter what dose it is. From the time you give the drug, let's say you give the drug at time zero, zero minutes. And after one minute, the drug, you know, the drug begins to show its effects, which means it's reached the brain, all the way to the brain, and it's now in the brain having its effects. So a drug with a lower blood, blood solubility just means 
that you will have the effect, the onset of action of the drug. Onset of action will be at a lower time. Increase onset of action, basically. So it doesn't take as long. And ways that some things that we do try to do, basically, to kind of compare these two. There's other terms within these two. So for blood solubility, they use something called blood gas partition coefficient. I'm just going to put blood gas partition coefficient. That's just saying it's comparing the blood solubility of the drug over the gas solubility of the drug. So if you have a decreased blood solubility for whatever drug, let's say drug X, if you have a decreased blood solubility, imagine that this, this is a fraction. That just means you have a decreased blood. The top number here, the B of the letter, I'm sorry, is going to be lower than the bottom number, which is then the gas solubility of the drug. So that means that this will also be lower. So a, so a decreased blood solubility equals a decreased blood gas partition coefficient. And they may not always tell you blood solubility. They may give you a blood gas partition coefficient. It'll be some decimal or could even be a whole number to some decimal or whatever. And so that's a way that they're going to tell you what the blood solubility is by giving you this blood gas partition coefficient. A way that they can tell you the potency is to either describe the lipid solubility to you. If there's an increased lipid solubility, we know there's an increased potency. Or potency affects, like we know that lipid solubility affects potency. Another thing that potency will affect is the minimum alveolar concentration. That is... And really, I just like to write 50. It's not usually written that way, but it's in the definition, you'll understand why. The minimum alveolar concentration of a drug is the lowest amount of the drug needed in the alveoli to begin to show its effect. So that's very similar to potency. But in this situation, it's the minimum alveolar concentration needed to show the effects of an anesthetic in 50% of the patients that are reported, like let's say in a trial of 2,000, when 1,000, right at the point, right at the minimum alveolar concentration, as you're increasing the concentration of the drug given to all those 2,000 patients, when 1,000 patients, which would be half of the total population, begins to show its effects, whatever that lowest dose was, they start to show the effects is the, MA, is the minimum alveolar concentration. And I just wrote, like I said, it's not usually written MAC50, but you can write it as that. So an increased potency means there's an increased lipid solubility and means there's a, um, there's a decreased minimum alveolar concentration. Because think about it. A, if you're starting to show the effects in all the people in your trial or 50% of the people in your trial at a lower concentration of a drug, that is the very definition of potency. That means you have an increased potency. So see, this is opposite here, so be careful of that. Increased potency means you have a decreased MAC50. So now, let's get kind of into, let's get into the actual, what I wanna talk about. You have a drug, this is the second gas effect, and I'm just gonna take two of the, anest of the inhaled anesthetics, halothane, there's other ones, but I'm going to, this is simplified. Halothane and nitrous oxide. Now, basically, the drug is taken, you know, it's inhaled through a ventilator and taken down into the alveoli. Two, some things you need to know about these two drugs, just comparing these two. Nitrous oxide has a very low blood gas partition coefficient. What does that mean? That just simply means it has a low blood solubility. So imagine you give nitrous oxide by itself. Let's just first say you give nitrous oxide by itself. You give the nitrous oxide by itself and it's mixed with some oxygen. So let's say we have, I don't know, 70% is nitrous oxide and 30% is oxygen, okay? Is oxygen. So this 70% nitrous oxide, because it has such a low blood solubility, we know that it will show its effects very rapidly from the time it's given. The reason is because here's the blood vessel and here's the brain that we saw earlier. And sorry for the drawing. Here's the brain and here's the, so we know that it goes from the lungs to the uh, blood vessels to the brain and then it can also go back, but it has to be in that order. So 
nitrous oxide when it does end up crossing over into the bloodstream it's it's has such a low solubility in blood that it doesn't stick around in the blood very long and because and so because of that it tends to go it tends to jump quickly from the lungs to the blood and easily gets over here to the brain and it happens very easily because it, the the blood solubility doesn't hold it in the blood whereas halothane has a very high blood solubility blood solubility that has a high blood gas partition coefficient so when halothane comes down it enters when it does enter into the bloodstream it has a very high blood solubility so it tends to just hang around in the blood and you have a trouble getting it to the brain as fast as the nitrous oxide can get so in essence what that means is that nitrous oxide can equilibrate because you know how the con you know how concentrations work basically if you have a, a box and it has two sections and this was a permeable semi permeable membrane and let's say halothane is here or whatever just a substance that can go to e either compartment this can travel back and forth if you put it all if you put all this in here eventually the amount will equal out right eventually it'll basically equal out and it will eventually uh, eventually equilibrate and that's what's happening but but nitrous oxide can equilibrate faster and that's the reason that nitrous oxide has that lower blood solubility thus the lower blood gas partition coefficient whereas halothane has a higher blood solubility and thus a higher blood gas partition coefficient now the potency it's completely different we said that nitrous oxide acts fast because of this low blood solubility but the potency is very low for nitrous oxide this means that you need a large amount of nitrous oxide before you would ever see the effects and remember earlier I said that potency is primarily based off of lipid solubility we have a low potency because the lipid solubility is very low for nitrous oxide okay so that's so that tells you you're gonna need a lot of nitrous oxide to show any effects and this makes sense as to why nitrous oxide is rarely ever given as just one drug like say to act as an inhaled anesthetic you always usually see nitrous oxide giving given with another inhaled anesthetic and inhale another inhaled anesthetic that would maybe need help equilibrating so it's going to use nitrous oxides a fantastic ability of decreased blood solubility that has a rapid onset and it's going to basically nitrous oxide will assist halothane to equilibrate faster and halothane is going to help nitrous oxide by not needing as much of a dose so you can give a very low dose of halothane and still see the effects so they're helping each other so that means halothane halothane has a high potency and remember a high potency means a high lipid solubility right it can pa it can cross over the membranes extremely fast so that's dealing so don't don't mix it up an increased lipid solubility means you have an increase in I'm sorry you don't need as much of the drug before you see the first effects this has nothing to do with the uh, the speed the potency has nothing to do with the speed of, of of onset that is all determined by a blood solubility and you need a low blood solubility so that it doesn't get trapped in the blood the kind of in the bloodstream of the body and it's able to get into the tissues faster and equilibrate like nitrous oxide is now let me show you why giving nitrous oxide with halothane makes basically makes the drug more effective basically it, it, it has to deal with concentrations so I'm gonna draw another alveoli let's let now let's give nitrous oxide and halothane together and naturally with oxygen let's say we're gonna give 70 percent nitrous oxide 28 percent oxygen and 2 percent halothane those ratios should make sense at least in our example because I said halothane 
has such a high potency that you would see the effects at a lower concentration. It makes sense that you need a lot of nitrous oxide because the potency is very low and then obviously oxygen has to always be with it. Now here's why it's, this works. You give these three together. Remember I said nitrous oxide has its effects that happen extremely fast and it's because when you give these three, the first one to equilibrate among all three of these things, the alveoli, the blood, and the brain, the first one to equilibrate is nitrous oxide. So what does that mean? Well, before oxygen and halothane ever get a chance to equilibrate between the three compartments, nitrous oxide has already done so. So imagine we give these three. Nitrous oxide will equilibrate between, let's just ignore the, the brain right now. Nitrous oxide will equilibrate between the alveoli and the blood and the blood vessels and it will basically you know be equal on both sides so let's say it'll become 35 percent and 35 percent right half of 70 35 and 35 and it will happen it will equilibrate way before the oxygen and the halothane have even had a chance to and that's because of that blood solubility the blood solubility is so low so in essence now let's look at the comparison Here's a, so you take these three, you add them up, that's 100% of the gas, right? Total, that's entering in. Now look, now when you add these three up, because half of the nitrous oxide has already, has already left to the blood vessels and it's already been equilibrated, if we're ignoring the brain tissue, that means that now the new total is 35 plus 28 plus 2. So in other words, the new total is at a lower percentage. So this is a lower percentage here. So now, the, as far as the concentration is concerned, we didn't change the levels of oxygen, we didn't change the levels of halothane, or even change the levels. The only level percentage that changed in the alveoli itself was the nitrous oxide. So now, the 28% oxygen and the 2% halothane are at a, there, there's far more of that as far as concentration wise, because all of that 30, the other 35%, of the nitrous oxide has left over to the blood. So now you have a higher concentration of halothane and oxygen in the alveoli and thus you will have a stronger effect of that halothane. So whereas before we started out with you know 2% halothane, now the halothane percentage is actually gone up in relativity to relative to the other two because the nitrous oxide which was the primary gas coming in from the ventilation machine has been cut in half so now they're far they're a lot closer to the number of the nitrous oxide now so the concentration as far as the percentage even though we haven't put any more halothane in the percentage of halothane has gone up and the percentage of oxygen has gone up that's what's called the second gas effect, and that's how we get a stronger effect of other anesthetics using nitrous oxide. Now, what is diffusion hypoxia? It's just completely flip it. Imagine we turn the ventilation machine off. When we turn the ventilation machine off, here's up here, and here's the bloodstream. Remember that the nitrous oxide has equilibrated. Now everything has eventually equilibrated, but we had a stronger effect because the nitrous oxide equilibrated far faster. So it will help with showing the effects uh, better. And basically, it will help to equilibrate with these other ones because we're messing with the concentration gradient. What happens when you turn the machine off and the patient needs to recover? Well, all of that, the concentration of the haloth, I'm sorry, of the nitrous oxide that large percentage of the nitrous oxide that it equilibrated between the three compartments now it needs is going to begin to rush back because it's being cleared from the body right and it's being cleared through the lungs you're breathing it out so it all rushes back and I said that nitrous oxide has such a low blood solubility that when it's coming from the tissues like the brain like muscle and everything else when it's coming from those tissues and it's going to the blood stream to get to the back to the lungs the problem is it can't it can't be it's not soluble in blood it's a it has a terrible blood solubility so it's it basically rockets in speed over to the alveoli and it happens so fast the concentration of nitrous oxide rushes to the alveoli so high that now remember before the concentration of oxygen 
had actually been increased when nitrous oxide rushed to the bloodstream, but now it's the opposite. Now the oxygen concentration is going down because nitrous oxide has just overwhelmed it so fast that the oxygen has not had a chance to equilibrate as fast as the nitrous oxide. What is this going to cause? This is causing hypoxia, hypoxic conditions. And so how do you fix that? You ventilate the patient with 100% oxygen. Um, I hope this helped. Uh, I really studied this and it took me like a day or two to figure this out of nonstop studying just these two concepts. Um, I, I, like I said, I, f I found a couple other videos that I, I thought they did a great job explaining it, but I wanted to focus on just these concepts and help you understand everything about this. So I hope this helps. Please leave any comments, any feedback, uh, like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.